Amiga was not the only interesting thing in 1994. Well, in reality, in 1994, it was on its last legs, as it was the year when Commodore eventually went bankrupt and the Amiga brand was passed between many players like a hot potato. Ultimately, I hope that it was by total coincidence and not a way for bad luck, most of them went bankrupt too. But that's a subject for another video. What I wanted to say is that in 1994, first concept of CSS was created and PHP language was released, both of these prophesied soon to come Web 2.0. Intel released its second generation of Pentium processors, just to recall millions of them later on in the year, as they had a hardware mathematical flow causing them to perform floating point operations incorrectly. It was also a year where first foundations of what we were soon to know as Bluetooth were laid out, and totally unrelated to that, IBM released its Simon Personal Communicator that historically became the first smartphone. Perhaps not as smart as we would have expected today, but more than just a machine to make calls, which was a lot back then. And last but not least, Microsoft released MS-DOS 6.22, a foundation to the beta of Windows 95, that was also released to developers. And it's the time where I usually gently point you towards those two amazing shiny like and subscribe buttons below. They're not a lot of work to click for you, but make a huge difference for me. So smash them if you don't mind, and if you're in a more generous mood, I also have a Patreon. Details are in the description below. But that's totally voluntary, and would only help me make better content and upgrade my recording gear. All videos will be here on YouTube for free as usual, just a day later than on Patreon. Thanks! 1994 was not as big of a year gaming-wise as 1993 was, although you'll get to witness that in a minute yourself. But if you disagree, I think we should discuss it in the comments below. And make sure to let me know which year do you think was the best for the Amiga. Anyway, as I was saying, it was not the best year, but quite a few really cool games, some theoretically impossible to run on the system, came out and were a lot of fun to play some more than others. Additionally, two games released in 1993 are in this video as well, all because I've made the mistake of overlooking them last week. And they just had to be included in the series, they're that good. It will be mentioned when I talk about them though, so that's just to let you know that they're not here by mistake. Well, at least not this week's mistake. Oh, and make sure to watch the video all the way through to the end, as I always hide second or two long game code pop-ups for Steam or GOG games in them. One per video in random spots. Perhaps too little too late, but Aladdin on the Amiga while requiring a GA chipset is incredible version of the title. Sure, push up to jump was always a nightmare, but it did offer a two-button joystick option for those who had this. 256 color graphics, beautiful instrumental rendition of Aladdin's theme song and silky smooth gameplay is what Amiga games should look like. Couple of years earlier. Because by 1994, Commodore has been long in financial trouble and soon to go bankrupt. And its future seemed inevitable. Anyway, the level design is quite fun and the graphics straight out of animated movie are a treat to behold. The gameplay is also stellar, placing Aladdin, even though it was quite late game for the system, as one of the better titles in the genre. So even if you're not into platformers, it's worth having a go at it, just to see what Ami was capable of, if given a chance. Alien Breed Tower Assault, the last game in Team 17's trilogy of overhead shooters, is easily the best in the series. The graphics are absolutely the best to the Amiga could offer by 1994, and the sounds are also heavy, atmospheric and horror-inducing. Story-wise, you're one of two survivors, well, there's two of you if you play in co-op. Anyway, you were a survivor and you were on your way to help a remote deep space barracks facility that was sending a distress signal. But as you were approaching the planet they were on, automatic defenses shot you down. And once again you have to go through the whole facility and survive. This time, however, the game offered few slight but interesting improvements. You can shoot and walk backwards, which, funny enough, was not the case in earlier titles. And most importantly, there are more than one exit from each level, meaning the game could be completed in roughly 276 different ways, depending what paths were chosen. If you manage to do that, that is, as it's as difficult as it's always been. But if you can only pick one of three games for whatever reason, definitely pick this one. Arcade Pool is my most favorite pool game on the Amiga. Come to think of it, I believe that Arcade Pool may be my most favorite pool even to this day, 30 years later, as I don't remember ever playing a game in a genre I would enjoy as much. Graphics-wise, it's nothing to write home about, but there's quite obvious care put to it, so everything looks really nice and is animated smoothly. Top-down view is definitely the right choice, as all pool balls are in the view at all times, and it makes those difficult shots easier to plan out and pull off. Sounds, well, I don't want to repeat myself, but are also nothing special. They're serviceable, but they don't need to be over the top in a game like that. And since we've got the technicalities out of the way, let's tackle the most important thing. Playability. In single player, it's okay, and a great way to spend an afternoon. 
but in multiplayer that supports up to 8 players, it's just amazing. I wouldn't say that it's as good as playing the game in real life, but it's damn close. Especially that you can run your own tournaments while having drinks and chatting with friends. Well, at least that's how I envision playing it. Team 17's Assassin Special Edition is what Amiga Sports of Strider should have been but fell short of. It's a side-scrolling action platformer. But why are we talking about Special Edition when we've not tackled the first one at all? Well, this is a much better, more polished version of the game. And as much as I really appreciate this one, original was extremely annoying to me. It used oddly behaving boomerang as a weapon and in early Team 17's fashion was too difficult to be enjoyed. This is a better outing, with a laser gun instead of a boomerang and a considerably more acceptable difficulty level. Story-wise, you're an assassin hired to kill the body of the game, a man called Midan. And no more details here are necessary, as it's an action game and not an RPG. Comparison to Strider was based on the fact that protagonists of both games move in a similar way attaching themselves to walls, ceilings and parkouring their way through the levels. Assassin Special Edition is a real good late game for the Amiga, a budget release perhaps, but better than most fully priced ones. Bunch is considered by many as the best shooter on the Amiga. Not by me, but I do agree it's one of the better ones and sadly another case of too little too late. But I suppose this may be a pattern with many of those mid-90s games here. It was released in 1994 and required AGA chipset, limiting the pool of potential players quite considerably. And since when Commodore went bankrupt, not many Amiga owners working on upgrading to a newer machine, turning instead towards a more stable PC platform. Banshee did nothing to help in fighting for Amiga's Phoenix like Resurrection, perhaps even impaired it. But that's one for the history books. Anyway, the game's a vertically scrolling shoot em up, with a mixture of beautiful steampunk and World War II aesthetics, sprinkled with a beefy, heavy and well-chosen sound effects. If you like shoot em ups, it's definitely not one to skip, and if you'll get a chance, you should give it a go. Beneath a Steel Sky is a living proof, well, not living per se, let me start again. Beneath a Steel Sky is a proof that game design is a subject of evolution too, especially in terms of storytelling, in games that had any story that is. The subjects tackled with each year became more serious, more grown up, deeper and more involving, often posing serious social or moral problems to solve. And Beneath a Steel Sky is no different, it's a beautiful science fiction cyberpunkish point and click adventure that focuses its vocal point on uncovering an overwhelming corruption of its dystopian world. It's also one of the best and most fun adventure games full of puzzles that are in majority quite logical and do not require much trial and error. Given the scope of the story I'd risk saying that Beneath a Steel Sky is an interactive movie, but that may be a bit too far-fetched as presentation-wise it's on the same level as most other adventure games of the time. That's debatable, however. What's not is the disc swapping nightmare that this otherwise great game induces coming on 15 floppies. Benefactor is one of the best exclusives for the Amiga and sadly also one of the lesser known titles. It's a very unique puzzle platformer that's a mixture of Lemmings, Sleepwalker and any other generic action platformer. Sounds odd but it's so well executed and designed that you won't stop playing even for a minute to ponder about it. You control a small character whose name is a wordplay on the title, Ben E. Factor, and he has to save tiny red creatures from captivity. Each level poses a different logical and platforming challenge, and you have to use both, your agility and tiny creatures to solve them. Little fellas can be tossed higher than you can jump, cross paths that are shorter and you wouldn't fit through, and be used to turn on or off various switches, and help in many other ways. They like lemmings without pre-assigned skills and just do what's required, where it's required, if placed on the right path. Benefactor is a game that's best understood when played and not seen or read about. And it's also when you most appreciate it for the unusual action puzzling fun that it offers. Body Blows Galactic is a better out of both games. Much better in fact. But still nowhere near the behemoths of playability like Street Fighter 2, Mortal Kombat or even later released versus fighters on the Amiga. It's a game that proves that technically Ami was more than capable of having an amazing 2D versus fighting titles, but in the same time confirming that Team 17, despite their other amazing games, is definitely not the team that should deliver it. It's an uninspiring and lackluster in everything apart from graphics and character design title that should be avoided if any other decent games in the genre are available. Body Blows Galactic is a game that could, but didn't. Very same year Team 17 also released Ultimate Body Blows on CD32, an obvious money grab that was a compilation of both games under a singular title. It wasn't any better than the original two, so hardly deserves anything more than those two sentences here. Bob on Sticks is beautiful. 
I mean, you can see that it is, but trust me, it's like that all throughout the game. Cartoon-like quality is strong in this one, and gameplay is no worse. Not many platformers in the early 90s on any of the available platforms offered similar quality of graphics and such huge sprites. I mean, just look at the main character or the tree that follows him around for a short while. It's huge. Sounds and music are pretty decent too, but not something you would remember or hum after playing. Gameplay is really fun though, even if latter levels are quite challenging. It's another of those titles that were a bit late to the Amiga saving party, and while being of unquestionably and undeniably high quality, failed to change the future of the system. If you like platformers, especially those that offer some simple puzzles every now and then, give Bob and Sticks a go as it's one that won't let you down. Under the cute and cartoony graphics of Bubble and Squeak hides a very competent and fun puzzle platformer. Teacher Bubble and Squeak have to work together solving puzzles to complete levels and save planet Gruus Populous that was kidnapped by the evil Cut of Nine Tails. And Bubble can go to town on Squeak, quite literally. The abuse has no bounds here and is taken to the next level. Comical level, that is, as it's all in good fun for humorous purposes only, and there's no real violence in a game and no aliens were harmed during development of this title. So I heard. So Bubble can kick and toss Squeak left and right, and he does, and the game is fun the end. Uh, I'm kidding. The symbiotic relation between the two characters is the main mechanic and is used in all levels. To bigger extent in the latter ones, where it's a bit less platformy and more puzzly, but Bubble and Squeak is definitely one of the most unusual games of 1994 on the Amiga, and one worth tracking down and playing. Canon Fodder 2 had very big shoes to fill from the get-go. After all, not only first Canon Fodder was universally praised and immensely popular among both players and critics, but was also a really good game. And yeah, one does not always guarantee another. Look at Buddy Blows, for instance. They're universally praised really, really bad games. Canon Fodder 2 had to follow one of the overall best games on the Amiga. How do you do something like that? You innovate and change only little itty bitty bits and pieces not to break the winning formula. And that's what Sensible Software did. They've raised the difficulty quite a lot and changed the setting location of some missions. With alien themed levels being most questionable choices that were a red hot talking point among fans of the first game. And something many never liked. It is not a bad game, it's really really good actually. It just suffers from a sequel syndrome, which hardly ever allows for a follow up to be as good or better than a genius first outing. Great example of that would be The Matrix. Yes, the movie. To this day I am incredibly happy that there were no crappy sequels released to it and that it's a singular movie from 1999 with no follow-ups at all ever premiered or talked about. None. Yes, that is the actuality of our reality. No more than one movie. Just The Matrix. In short, Canon for the 2 is way too difficult but otherwise good game that failed in its attempt of outgrowing its predecessor. The Clue is by far the most unusual and perhaps ambitious title of 1994 and one of the most important games in history, even if it's largely ignored, forgotten or even worse unknown. It's a very complex but brilliantly executed mixture of strategy, management and adventure game. In short, it lets you live out your wildest Ocean 13 dreams of being a master thief. International burglar with skill and a team to pull off even the biggest heist. And as with most best management games of the era, the Clue 2 is a masterwork of a German developer. But by now, I'm sure it's not a surprise to anyone watching those history videos. And to clarify, I'm not German, don't speak the language, so I'm not trying to push my own agenda here. Anyway, in the clue, you start small with minor burglaries for little profit, going bigger and bigger with each job, until you finally tackle the ultimate crap of the game in the form of royal crown jewels. It's a game that requires heaps of patience as you have to assemble a team for each job, get appropriate tools and then carefully and thoroughly plan out the heist. Step by step. Literally. I'm not exaggerating. But if you do give it time, remember about location surveillance, pick the right team and tools, and plan the perfect theft, the clue is incredibly rewarding when everything goes as planned. Watching it play out perfectly gives satisfaction hardly any game does, even to this day. Before it was released, the original Dungeon Master was internally called Crystal Dragon by its developers. This game is also called Crystal Dragon. It's also a dungeon crawling party based RPG in high fantasy setting, and also brutally difficult perhaps even more so than the original was. But it's made by a completely different developer, so I suppose this background intro was totally unnecessary. I never played it back then, I'm not gonna lie, so my experiences are very limited with this one. What I can tell you though, will be based on reviews and confessions that I read, and a gameplay video I saw on YouTube. Coincidentally, also in part the one that you're watching now. So, Crystal Dragon is a huge game, spawning multiple levels in which you can travel not only on one plane, but also downwards via use of pits. 
The fights are quite challenging and require a careful approach as it's easy to die and there's no option to resurrect fallen characters. And last, and in that particular case definitely least, the game is brown greyish all throughout. Which may also be a reason why I haven't played it back then as this particular mix of colors was a huge turn off for me. Let me preface everything else that I will say about Deluxe Galaga by stating that I'm an idiot. Perhaps it's not apparent at most times, but I think I really am. I have no way of proving that as I was never diagnosed with anything, but there's no other explanation to what had happened. Well, Deluxe Galaga came out in 1993 and not 1994. But as I was preparing the last video, I was convinced that it was 1995 based on Lemon Amiga's game page. As I've started working on this video, it kinda dawned on me that the games I was writing about I had after and not before I did Deluxe Galaga. So I dug a tad deeper and surprise surprise, it was in fact 1993 when it came out. So, as an exception and a testament to its quality, Deluxe Galaga is the first of two games that I will feature torn out of their time. And talk about in this video just because they deserve to be cherished as a part of Amiga gaming history. So, with all that out of the way, let's talk about it. It's a single screen wave based shoot em up that's superior version to the arcade original it's loosely based on. And it offers tons of weapons, upgrades and downgrades. The game is divided into levels that are of various kinds, so there's usually two levels featuring same kind of enemies, and then the third one that is identical, but in addition to those enemies there are always corresponding similar bigger ones that we called the mothers back in the day. After a set of those three levels is complete, you're alternating between a singular bonus level or a kamikaze attack stage where enemies drop down on you in waves. Those stages do not require complete destruction of all alien forces, but offer extra points if you do so. You will encounter also two kinds of stages, a meteor storm that is triggered by a specific in-game pickup. It's potentially very profitable and to complete it you have to fly for a specific set distance while avoiding waves upon waves of meteors. And warp malfunction stage which happens when, well, warp malfunctions and where you have to fight against warp creatures. They drop rank markers used for in-game promotions, so it's not a waste of time. And last but not least, every 25 levels you're facing a real full-fledged bosses that not only require memorization of their attack patterns, but also practice. There is an in-game shop where you can upgrade your ship and you should do so as each consecutive level features tougher and tougher enemies. Deluxe Galaga is not only a title that has a separate individual review on my channel, but also, in my opinion, is the very best shooter on the Amiga. Video doesn't give it justice, you have to play it for yourself. If you ever wondered how it was to be Henry Ford, car manufacturing magnate, wonder no more. Detroit is the game that will place you in the shoes of such individual, or wanna be with a bit of cash and plans and hopes for the future, as you start at the bottom and the road to the top is not short or an easy one in the slightest. While Detroit is automobile-focused management strategy game, and a very good one at that, it was not made in Germany, but I suppose it's an exception that confirms the unwritten rule. Anyway, it's a title for those who love graphs, numbers, stats and a lot of planning as that's what you'll be mainly doing. You have to erect a factory, assemble line, hire workers and plan the way your cars will be built and how they'll look like. And they can be anything from your everyday sedans, through pickups, to vans, off-roads and everything in between. With each of the components being of various technological and material quality. So aside from manufacturing and selling of vehicles, you'll have to stay on top of the research too. Making sure that you don't fall behind the competition. Always innovating and introducing new solutions to previously non-existent problems that surface along with customers' newfound requirements. It's a really cool title that may be a bit on a slower side, but it's really fun nonetheless. Dragonstone is a sequel to Dark Mirror. It looks amazing, it has very Zelda-esque design to it, in both graphics and gameplay, at least when compared to early Zelda titles. Is it as good or as fun though? No, nowhere near, but while Zelda games are internationally recognized classics, Dragonstone is just a sequel to a game that, while being fun, was just one of the many on an obscure platform. Personally, I would prefer if ability to upgrade or change weapons and shields was added, and if the game did not suffer from difficulty downhill. Meaning that at a certain point the difficulty just stops, and from then onwards falls quite considerably, making the late game a breeze. Which for the most part is not bad, just not very challenging. Dream Up is probably one of the most unusual adventure games on the Amiga. For many reasons, and all good really. It's the most dark and atmospheric game out of all of them, playing out in a, let's say, dark and gritty near future, that's not quite cyberpunk, but not far off either. You're essentially tasked by an unknown person in your dreams to kill seven people in order to save mankind. This raises a series of ethical questions which game really never tries to answer. Dream Up is also a mature title full of adult overtones with bloody violence and sexual content all throughout. 
And lastly, the perspective you play from is unique as it's top-down view that I don't believe I've seen in any other game until original GTA came out. Interestingly enough, DreamWeb shares something with Elder Scrolls titles from Bethesda. To be precise, nearly anything in the game can be picked up and carried in inventory, even if its usefulness is questionable or non-existent. It's not a title for teens or kids, even if that's what most of the players of it back in the day were. It's a story for grown-ups, by grown-ups and about grown-ups. A game worth completing at least once. Elfmania is not a great game, but it's here for a reason. Its own existence and smoothly animated graphics and sound are a proof that Street Fighter 2 arcade quality game was capable on the Amiga. And we didn't have to settle on titles like Body Blows and such. Coming back to Elfmania though, other than the graphics and sound it's an average fighter at best using various elves as combatants. Sadly the moves are very limited and each character has a single and usually not too great special. No combos of any shape or form. Interesting mechanic that is not enough to save the game are the coins it drops from opposing fighters when you land successful hits. They can be used to unlock better, stronger fighters for use in your single player campaign. So it's worth collecting those, that is if you settle on playing the game at all. Franco the Crazy Revenge is a very obscure Polish beat'em up, known most likely only in the country and among those who were actively looking for fighting and beat'em up games on the Amiga. Funny fact, the title's in English but everything else in game is entirely in Polish. From any written text, through omnipresent wall graffitis, to sampled vocals. Not that it makes any difference in gameplay, but it's worth mentioning. The game itself takes place in Stettin, a capital of northmost western province in Poland in the early 90s. You're reading one of two buff, clearly stereotyped dudes that kick ass, break legs and punch noses in, quite literally I must add, of virtually anyone who stands in their way. The graphics are not something you'll be writing home about, but the overwhelming brutality and gorefest that fills the screen at an alarming rate is something that was definitely not common back in the day. Apart from maybe Mortal Kombat series of games and Moonstone. It's ugly but quite fun beat em up with only real downside being level loading in parts. Meaning every group or two of enemies the game will pause for a few seconds to load more data. It's really annoying and takes you out of experience for a bit, but not to the point of discouraging from playing. Fury of the Fairies is an absolute gem. It's one of the most if not the most ambitiously designed and well thought out Amiga platformer. To simply put, you're in charge of four differently colored fairy characters, each with unique skill set. The red one can chew basically through anything, biting all the walls, floors and anything else on his way. The yellow can shoot basic and charge shot, both quite useful in offense against hordes of cutesy enemies and most importantly, in certain puzzles alike. Blue fairy can swim, dive and shoot bubbles of his ass, uh, I mean just bubbles. The jury is still out on that. And last but definitely not least, spider pig, I mean the green fairy. He has a grapple and a line and ladies and gentlemen, he works this too like a chump crossing over large stretches of environmental obstacles, going where no other fairy went before and pulling things that could, well, at least in this game, only be pulled via line. All in all, you've got to utilize all these skills to complete increasingly more difficult levels in variously themed worlds. Each and every stage is a little puzzle, in latter areas requiring sharp thinking and often godlike dexterity, but having worked out when and how to use every one of these little colorful rascals is really rewarding. And the cherry on top of this already great cake of a game are bonus areas hidden in every single level. At times even nested within each other like some kind of crazy coins filled Russian nesting dolls. Best of all, difficulty growth in Fairy of the Fairies is very gradual, allowing player to learn all the tropes before being dropped in deep water. That said, make no mistake, misjudging the title for what it is. As I mentioned earlier, it's a very much game of skills as much as a game of wits. Easy to get into and devilishly hard to master. You can learn more about it in a complete video review of it that I have on my channel. I always thought of Guardian as being Amiga's answer to Star Fox. Perhaps not as varied in terms of location and enemies, with no encompassing story and less smooth gameplay, but Amiga doesn't have the Super FX chip to accelerate the graphics, so it's an achievement nonetheless. In reality, however, Guardian was nothing more than Defender in 3D. In other words, you have to defeat all enemies while keeping all installations intact if possible. Simple as that. And while it may seem boring, it's not. It's actually pretty fun, even if a bit too challenging for my liking. The 3D untextured graphics did not age best, but for the time were something us basic A500 Amiga owners look with jealousy at. Guardian requires AGA chipset and was released on CD32 first, and then slightly stripped down on A1200. So if you have any choice in the matter, CD32 version is the one to play.
Heimdall 2 Into the Hall of the Worlds is an isometric action-adventure game with RPG elements set in the world of Norse mythology and a continuation of 1991's Heimdall. Many of the technical issues from the first game were fixed and in general gameplay was streamlined. So the whole party building element is gone and the fights are less tactical and more hack and slashy. Is it better? Hard to tell, it's definitely easier so if you're in the mood for an interesting adventure rather than the punishing one, second game is the better choice. All the puzzles in game are a tad easier than previously too, so it's less trial and errory and more straightforward. Graphics are even better than in predecessor and really show what Amiga was capable of and a testament to core designs artists. Sounds however are quite sparse, so I won't even attempt judging them. They're there sometimes and that's all I can say about them. Hero Quest 2 Legacy of Sorosil is a sequel to 1991's Hero Quest and also based on the same named tabletop role-playing game. There are some changes to the formula as compared to its predecessor however, the world types are not limited to only those that were in the original board game which allowed developers to spread their wings when it came to level designs, so they're bigger and much more interesting than before, with many more areas to be searched and seen. The characters actually gain experience now, getting better with time which is an excellent improvement for any and all RPG fans. On the downside though, the save option is only ever available in between the levels and there's only 9 of them. Many in the game is not overly long but can be saved mid-mission, which can be seen as more immersive but personally I never like the idea of fixed save points. While Holiday Lemmings 94 is a decent expansion pack full of fun levels to conquer, it holds a dark dark secret. Nah, I'm kidding. But out of 64 levels only half are new and the other is from released a year earlier Holiday Lemmings 93. But since the earlier title had only 32 levels, if you were to settle on one, pick the newer one as it's twice the levels for the same price. I would presume as I'm not really following the prices of older games anymore. Anyway, it's the same good old Lemmings puzzling with all the usual skills and mind-boggling levels to beat. If you love the other games, you'll love this one. Innocent Until Caught is a conversion from PC, but pretty well done if I say so myself. Graphics look as if they were touched up and not just straight up color reduced from 256 to 32. Sure, they would have looked better at full palette, but given in what state the late Sierra games were moved to Amiga, this is really a good port. It's a point and click adventure game taking place in future, in space, in year 2171. And you're Jack T. Ladd. A space thief who's been finally found by the tax office and is ordered to pay his overdue taxes or face the consequences. Which in the future happens to be death. Quite drastic, but given where our world seems to be going now, this may be very well what we'll be facing in the future too. Anyway, the game is pretty good story-wise, but a bit infamous for the difficulty of its puzzles and the fact that some of them don't have logical solutions. If you're a hardcore fan of adventure titles, this one's definitely not something you'll want to skip, otherwise there are easier and better games, and those that do not come on on godly 10 floppy disks. Isha 3 The Seven Gates of Infinity is universally considered the weakest outing out of all three games in the series. But it doesn't mean that it's a bad game. It was just unlucky to follow the best one without innovating and changing anything for the better. As with previous game, you can either create a new party at start or import one from either of the previous titles. The semi-open world of second game was dropped for this one and instead it came back to the roots of dungeon crawling offering five different mazes, each in a different location. The puzzles are a bit on a tougher side though meaning they will require a bit more thinking or a lot more trial and error, whichever you prefer. If you played the previous two titles, you'll know everything that there is to know about this one, and you'll know if you care to see the conclusion of the story. If you haven't, it's best to start with the first one anyway. Even though last in the Strike series, Urban Strike never saw release on the Amiga, second did. Jungle Strike is an action arcade shooter where you fly a combat helicopter over, well, jungle. Apart from first and last levels, that is, that take place in Washington DC. The game is as good as the first title, although more arcadey. There are some benefits to that though, as scrolling routines have been slightly improved for a much smoother movement. Jungle Strike feels more action-packed, more like a shooter as a result of that. Funny enough, while there were three separate versions released for the Amiga, OCS1 requiring 1MB, Amiga 500, AGA requiring A1200 and CD32. The AGA version was a fake though. It was virtually identical to OCS apart from the title screen and could be run on any Amiga as long as it had 2MB of chip RAM and did not use AGA chip capabilities at all. 
I haven't had a chance to check the CD32 version, but I have a sneaky feeling that it may have also not been using those extra available colors. If someone has means of checking it, let's say on Amiga CDTV, modded with 2MB of cheap RAM and at least Kickstart 2.0, I would appreciate a comment as I'm honestly curious about it. K240 is a superior sequel to Utopia that we spoke about in 1991's video. It's also a real-time strategy based in deep space, in year 2380, in a space sector called K240. And you're building colonies on asteroids to mine them for ore while fighting off hostile aliens. Funny enough, it was not the last game in the series and, a couple of years later, was superseded by a PC game going by the name of Fragile Allegiance. Coming back to our subject at hand though, K240 fixed everything that was not working with Utopia. So things like storage management or real-time combat and added many more mechanics making for an unforgettable experience and an amazing title to play. It's one of those games that has that one more turn factor not letting you go and pulling you ever so deeper in with every minute, even if it has no turns at all running in real time. The only real downside I could think of would probably the entry threshold that's quite steep and may require a few failed attempts before figuring out what's what. Although it may not look like it, but Kid Chaos is one of the more demanding platformers on the Amiga. Main character, world presentation and enemies play very similarly to Sonic the Hedgehog. The kit is fast and has a jump spinning attack and the levels seem to be made for high paced game. Apart from bumpers maybe, which I feel nearly half of seem to be placed in such a way as if they were made to slow you down rather than help you in gaining momentum. Well, whatever. Hit Chaos's graphics are pretty nice, if a bit too brownish for my liking, but there's no doubt that the care and attention was given to them so that they would not fall below 1994's Amiga standard. Multiplane parallax scrolling being the most prominent feature of it. I'm not a big fan of game as it's way too chaotic for me to enjoy, but I understand the appeal, especially that it served as a de facto technological proof of Sonic being theoretically possible on the Ami. What I did found as a nice surprise though were the minigames similar to Arkanoid and Galaga, both running in engine with titular characters serving either as a puddle for the first or a spaceship in second. Well, both Puddle and Spaceship may be far to fetch descriptions though, as he never really morphs into anything but... a uh, while. Well. Oh, why do I even bother? Obviously, you do understand what I have in mind, right? King's Quest VI Air Today Gone Tomorrow is a point-and-click adventure game and the last title released by Sierra on the Amiga. It was originally a PC CD exclusive, so converting it to floppy-based Amiga had to sacrifice quite a few of the features. First thing out of the door were the amazing voiceovers performed by talented voice actors. Second were the graphics. While AGA version was planned, in the end Amiga only ever saw OCS version with 32 colors, which compared to PCs 256 looked toned down and rather bland. Story-wise it's as good as expected, not in small part thanks to legendary Roberta Williams who was responsible for the best Sierra games. The most interesting part of King's Quest VI however is how the game is designed. Almost half of all puzzles is optional. Many of them have more than one solution and because of the game's open world design they can be completed in any order. Even better, more or less midway through the game you'll be able to choose to follow the longer, more puzzle oriented or shorter story path. The longer results in more satisfying game ending, but many of the parts of the ending are based on the choices taken throughout the game so they can vary considerably each playthrough, if different riddles are solved and especially if they're completed in different ways. While King's Quest VI is nowhere near being the best adventure game on the Amiga, it's definitely one of the more interestingly designed ones. Lamborghini American Challenge is Crazy Cars 3 we've tackled in 1992's video, but with a split-screen multiplayer. And yes, it's Lamborghini and not Lamborghini. And no, I'm not Italian. For those who haven't seen the video though, it's an arcade racer where you race around the tracks all over the USA to become the undisputed champion of illegal street racing scene. So you'll be set against a series of increasingly more difficult opponents, you'll be placing bets on races, and money won in those bets and races, you'll invest in upgrading your car the iconic Lamborghini Diablo. Graphics-wise, the game did not change much from 1992, but if it had to change at all is disputable, as it looked good enough even two years earlier. Sounds are the same as before too, but the addition of new soundtrack was a welcome, even if not game-changing, upgrade. Liberation Captive 2 is a dark cyberpunk role-playing game and a sequel to 1990's Captive. I've spoke about a certain year before, I believe it was 1991, as being a year of the sequel, yeah. but the further I go in this video the more I am convinced that it's 1994 that's the one. 
Liberation from the get-go was designed to be CD32 game, as it featured long cutscenes, voice acting and CD quality soundtrack. And if there were more games like that, perhaps it wouldn't have failed as a console. Anyway, the base Amiga outing that came on 5 floppies was stripped down version and even though it was as playable as the CD32 one, it lacked in many of the factors that made the game so special, like music and some of the sound effects. So if you have a choice, always go for the CD version, it's just superior. The game takes place in a huge fully explorable city with hundreds upon hundreds of accessible buildings, and in a way, the city of Liberation is more open and free to explore than many open world games of today are. I mean, comparing it to similarly themed Watch Dogs Legion released last year, where 95% of all buildings are facades. Liberation looks like a much bigger and better designed title. Given Amiga's capabilities, that is. That's not all, however, pretty much every feature you see in the city is either interactive or can be used, starting from taxis to buildings of various kinds actually offering services that they would in real life. And while your main goal is to gather the clues leading to and finally to free the prisoner, it's very easy to get lost in the world of liberation. In a good way, that is. Little Devil is an adventure puzzle game consisting of large maze containing rooms that each of offers different puzzles. The maze is navigated from behind the character perspective while the riddles in rooms are solved in a typical adventure game side view. Saying that Little Devil has nice graphics would be a disservice to it. They are beautiful and have a very heavy cartoon-like feeling to them. They're rich and colorful, although because of the setting being an underworld, they're in a big part a mixture of various shades of red and brown. Which may not be everyone's cup of tea. Many different ways the main character Matt can fail and get hurt are funnily animated and a definite highlight of the game providing a much needed comic relief. All the super relatives aside, Little Devil was originally released on PC and ported to the Amiga. And some cuts had to be made as developers themselves stated that going from a minimum of 4MB on PC to 2MB Amiga was a serious challenge. Henceforth, the animation may not be as fluid as it's on the grey box, missing some frames and sounds are most likely downsampled too. Oh well, such is life. Especially in a year when not only Commodore went bankrupt, but it became painfully obvious to majority of gamers that the future of gaming lied on PCs and consoles, and that the Amiga was sadly going nowhere anymore. Lords of the Realm is a medieval team strategy game where you compete against CPU or other players for the right of becoming King of England or King of Germany. On the main map where you manage your land and population, the game is played in turns, allowing for planning out your grand strategies for victory. Battles however take place in real time, where you can control all your units individually or as a group in RTS style. There is also an option for automatic determination of combat encounters for those who don't care for real time strategies, so players like myself. But trust me, as much as it's not my cup of tea, it's always better to approach those battles yourself rather than leave the resolution in digital hands of CPU. Lords of the Realm gathered overwhelming acclaim at launch and was generally very positively received by both players and reviewers. Amiga received two versions, for basic 1MB systems and for A1200 with AGA chipset. If you have a choice in the matter, it's best to pick the latter, cause not only it looks better, but also uses any and all systems expansions available and runs faster. I honestly don't know how most Street Fighter 2 ports to the Amiga could be so bad when we've got such amazing ports of Mortal Kombat. I really don't. And while Street Fighter's sprites were perhaps a tad bigger, they were drawn and could allow for much more freedom creatively when it came to their coloring scheme. Mortal Kombat featured digitized actors, so possible changes to the graphics were considerably more limited. And yet, Mortal Kombat that should have not been possible not only was released on the Amiga but robbed. Quite literally, as it sounded amazing both in terms of sound and music. I mean, who could have ever get bored of those meaty punches and kicks? Not to mention screams during fatalities that the game was infamous for. Graphically, Mortal Kombat is amazing. Sure, it may not be arcade perfect with a limited 32 color palette, but it's as close to it as possible, and for the game of this scope, it looks incredible. Gameplay-wise, everything was properly converted to the Amiga and nothing, not a single thing, is missing. So you'll go through all the same fights on your way to the top of the ladder, before facing Shang Tsung as you would have in the arcades. And in between the fights you'll tackle same challenges aptly named Test Your Might, based around crushing various materials with your hand, karate style. All moves, specials and fatalities are in the Amiga version too, and it's as bloody as the original and equally as fun. But it's not all good and dandy, and there's an elephant in the room we have to address. Well, or two of them in fact. So, elephant number one, numero uno, is the joystick controls. Sure, for someone like myself who played Mortal Kombat on Amiga more than on any other platform, they're easy to understand and use. Apart from fatalities that I just completely forgot. 
but for the average first time player they're not going to be the best. Ideally the game requires in my opinion at the very least three buttons. One for punching, one for kicking and the last one for blocking. But since we're not living in an ideal world it is what it is and just requires getting used to. And second of those two proverbial elephants is something that probably some of you already commented about under this very video. Well, there's no reason to circle around it anymore. Mortal Kombat same as Deluxe Galaga was released a year earlier in 1993 and not 1994. That overlooking a mistake is on me and for that I apologize. But in the same time I couldn't have left the game unmentioned. Still, it shouldn't have happened and for 1995 it won't. Well, I hope it won't, at least. All that aside, however, Mortal Kombat is a great conversion showing that there was still life in the Amiga even if there wasn't much of it in Commodore. There is no logical reason to compare it to other platforms with more capable hardware here, but for what it ended up being on the system, it's worth a spot in every Amiga's gamer's collection. While first Mortal Kombat was undoubtedly an achievement, second shouldn't have been possible on the Amiga at all. Nearly twice as many characters to choose from, each with many more new special moves, fatalities and stages, Mortal Kombat 2 is a much bigger game than the predecessor in every scope. And it shows as without extra RAM or second disk drive and despite only coming on free floppies, it's a disk swapping nightmare. Quite literally. It's not unusual when playing with just one drive and one megabyte of RAM to switch discs two, three times between fights or even mid-fight when Shang Tsung's changing into other characters. Even worse, when it came out there was no way of installing it on HD as first version of WHD load was released a couple of years later. But all that said, it's something that's while unbearable now, was not an uncommon occurrence back then. And an annoyance we've been used to living with. Joystick controls are similar to previous game, but with addition of many new moves some difficult choices had to be made. Like certain specials requiring holding button pressed for 5 seconds. Which in a fighter is ridiculous and not only you'll never get as much free time, but also this did not seem to apply to the CPU. That can pull those moves off instantly. Another pain of mine are the fatalities. They are so complicated now that some kind of godlike joystick acrobatics is required when trying to pull them off not to mention impeccable timing and exact distance that has to be kept while attempting. The biggest real issue however are the CPU opponents that cheat. Quite literally they do, countering your attacks even before the animation for them starts playing and not having the same timing requirements on special moves. There's an amazing YouTube video by Modern Vintage Gamer that I've linked in the description below that disassembles the game piece by piece proving that the CPU cheating actually occurs and how it's done. It's a good watch if you're interested in the subject that is. But fact that it's a broken game in single player does not mean that it's a bad game. Nope, on the contrary. Mortal Kombat 2 is incredibly fun to play against a friend when all the limitations are fairly spread between the players. And one versus fighter that I've probably played the most in early 90s with friends against each other as we all had that arcade Mortal Kombat fever. It goes without saying that presentation, while not using AGA chipset at all, is one of the best on the Amiga and a proof that it was a system that could still deliver A-class experiences if only developers cared to give it that little extra bit of attention. Now, my approach to this game will be controversial, so buckle your seatbelt. I'll tell you what Naughty Ones is and then I'll shut up for approximately 20 more seconds so you could watch it a bit more. And then we'll get to the next game. Why? Cause when I do, and if you watch the previous video covering 1993, it'll be clear what it's all about. So, Naughty Ones is like reskinned quack that's nearly equally as good when played alone as it is when played with a friend. That's it. On the ball is a football manager, but it's a bit different than all the other ones. Not only in terms of graphics, which are, while well, very specific in their design, quite nice and detailed, but especially in terms of how you approach the management aspect in general. You'll do same things you do in most other games in the genre, but there's increased attention put on both training and psychological aspects of the game. So, motivation and emotional well-being of players and your contacts and rapport with the press. Where an appropriate response can have beneficial consequences or opposed to that even break spirits of your team members. Admittedly, I haven't played on the ball as much as I should as my version kept hanging back in the day, but the very same version worked just fine on my friend's Amiga, so I watched him play it quite a bit. All that said, keep in mind that because of that, my personal experience with the game is very limited. PGA European Tour is easily one of the best if not the best golf game on the Amiga. Not only it's a very good looking title, especially on the AGA machines, but also simulates the sport in an attractive but feeling genuine way. Unlike Lynx however, which was another very prominent golf game, PGA European Tour loads up quite quickly and everything you do in the game seems near instantaneous. 
so you're wasting no time here on non-playable parts of the game. Graphics are excellent and the sounds for what they are supposed to represent are accurate. What is most important however is the gameplay and I gotta say that it's top notch and an incredible time to have with up to 3 others. It's one of those titles that have a very low entry point allowing for most, even completely unfamiliar with the sport, to play and enjoy right from the get go. But in the same time it's also challenging to master. Meaning that encompassing other players familiar with the game may require a lot of practice so that hardly ever games feel so one-sided that are unpleasant to play for the weaker competitors. Pirates Gold is the best looking version of Pirates on all 16-bit systems. It's not the best playing one though, but we'll get back to that in a little while. If I had to categorize Pirates Gold and put it in a labeled drawer corresponding to its genre, I'd say that I keep it in few of those little drawers. A copy in each. It's an RPG as you play as a titular pirate, a pirate captain to be precise, and as time goes by you age, gain experience and better your skills while succumbing to debuffs that the age brings with it. Said experience and skills however are not based on numbers like in typical RPGs, but in you, in real life getting better at the game and its mechanics. In the same time it's also an adventure game where you can be a ship captain, helping to conquer Caribbean for one of four European powers. English, Dutch, Spanish or French. You can look for your long lost family members, hidden treasures and perform missions for governors of various islands. But also you can forfeit it all and just be a pirate living off of sinking and plundering other ships, raiding outposts big and small and capturing gold fleets or silver trains. So, and this may already be quite obvious, it's also a life simulation. A very specific life, but one nonetheless. As I mentioned before, gold version of pirates is not the best playing one, the absolute best is the original, which coincidentally is also on the Amiga. It's most streamlined and fastest responding to controls. By its only abundance of pointless animations and additions that slow down the gameplay, like the requirement to actually walk around the town rather than being able to pick options from a menu, that is a downside of Pirate's Gold. Other than being slower than other versions, it plays identical and is the same great game, with an addition of in-game map that actually makes sailing much easier and more enjoyable. So if you haven't had a chance and this is the only version of the game available to you, don't worry about it, grab your parrot, grab a barrel of best slash strongest grog and lock yourself away for the weekend to immerse yourself in this amazing swashbuckling adventure. If you'd like to know more about it, there's a whole separate video review of pirates on this very channel. Pizza Connection aka Pizza Tycoon is a humorous business simulation and management game made by Software 2000, a German based, well, surprise surprise developer. You know, this began as a running joke a couple of videos ago that the German developers made the best management games in the 90s, but as we went more and more in depth with them throughout this whole Amiga gaming history series, it became clear that if it was anything, then it was not a joke but a fact. And Pizza Connection is another incredible example of that and also one of my absolute favorites. On the surface, you're a restaurant and in time chain of restaurants owner in a city either in Europe or US and you're responsible for everything from renting or buying a building for your pizzeria, all the equipment and furniture, to hiring staff and even designing your own pizzas, based on the taste and needs of the local neighborhood's populace. If that wasn't enough, you have to advertise your business, can take part in pizza competitions, or even deal with shady types, or sabotage your competition via peaceful or brutal means. Pizza Connection is a true gem and a real fun title to play either in single or multiplayer. And the only negative I could think of when talking about it would have to be that Amiga once more got the shorter end of the stick, with only German version available, while PC had the game in English too. Reunion is basically 1989's Millennium 2.2 but in newer clothing made by a different developer. But for all intents and purposes, it's the exact same game. To the point of even having the same shortcomings that original did. Like being able to manufacture ships only on your home planet, even though you may be having dozens of others readily under your control. Or enemies mainly targeting this exact planet and no other, even if they're much more remote and easier to capture. And finally, lack of any options to automate routes for mining, so everything has to be controlled by hand. It's probably not a biggie for micromanagement freaks, but for the rest of us, it's most definitely a tad annoying. That said, it's crucial that I explain that Reunion is not a bad game. Quite opposite, in fact. It's a very fun strategic management title with some adventure story overtones that, while a background to all that is happening, are actually pretty involving. It's one for the strategy fans that will no doubt enjoy it despite those small issues. If you however are a Sunday strategy player, then there are far better titles to try. Roadkill was developed by Vision and released on both CD32 first and later AGA Amigas. 
and right from the start it's quite obvious that it was designed for the console as the Control VCD32 gamepad is not only much more ergonomic, but also does not require using keyboard to shoot missiles. It doesn't mean that the AGA port is bad, quite the opposite in fact, it's just better played with a pad. Anyway, Roadkill is an overhead racing game set in the future where use of weapons is not only permitted while racing, but even encouraged. It's a really fun and rewarding game and definitely one of the best racers on the Amiga. Even if slightly crippled by two disappointing design choices. First being a complete lack of multiplayer, and if there ever was one actually implemented, Roadkill could easily become CD32's killer app and a console seller. Second, all turns and corners are set at exactly 90 degrees, and I'm not sure what's the reasoning behind that, especially that older, simpler games use diagonal turns without any issues whatsoever. It seems, however, that this largely irrelevant mystery will remain unsolved forever. On a side note, if you ever have a free spare minutes, I recommend going to AJ Roadkill's game page on Lemon Amiga, scrolling down the comments until you get to the gentleman named Retrovirus, and reading his deconstruction of what the game is really about. His analysis, while unworldly, is really captivating. Rough and Tumble is an action platformer and one of the most console-like experiences on the Amiga. The idea here is simple, you're Rough Rogers and you have to get through each level by collecting a specific amount of red, blue and green bubbles, keys and defeat all enemies. The idea is simple perhaps, but the game itself isn't. While it's undemanding at start, the difficulty ramps up quite fast with each level and at times feels overwhelmingly hectic. The trick however is not to let yourself be taken aback by it and progress slower, more carefully, going enemy by enemy rather than taking them all at once. It may seem unnecessary at first as Rough and Tumble seduces you with its beautiful graphics, big sprites and excellent design, but sooner you realize that slower is faster, the farther you'll get in the game. Thankfully Rough comes with a built-in password system so you don't have to always go through the whole game from the start. Despite Rough and Tumble's excellent presentation, there's one thing complain worthy. Scrolling. It's not terrible, don't get me wrong, but it just feels odd. It's hard to put a finger on it, hard to simply explain, and I'm not sure it's visible on the recording, but when you'll play it, you'll understand. The issue is not game breaking in any way, but a very minor annoyance that's worth mentioning. Even though the game is easily in top 10 best Amiga platformers, it's another case of the too little too late. Three, four years earlier if paired with more equally good games in various different genres and perhaps a new kind of controller that would offer more than just one fire button, there would be a fighting chance for the Amiga. Perhaps. But not in 1994. Sensible World of Soccer, while releasing in 1994 and being universally considered the best football game on the Amiga, will only get two sentences here today. Why? Well, 1995's updated 1.1 version is the ultimate outing of the game and will get its justice served to it in the last video in the history of Amiga gaming series in around a week or week and a half. Sierra Soccer is my most favorite football game on the Amiga. It's difficult enough to pose a challenge, but accessible and easy to control so that strategy management and role-playing gamers like myself will not feel lost and powerless playing it. The game uses a 3D engine that's while not very sophisticated, is very simple for the end user to understand and makes taking all those free kicks and penalties a pure pleasure. As you can finally feel that you have a control where the ball will be going. More or less. And yeah, seasoned kickoff or sensible soccer players can probably aim the ball in their respective titles with pinpoint accuracy, but as I mentioned initially, I am and always was mainly a strategy and role-playing gamer, so those high-octane, arcadey football games were beyond means of reasonable control for me. Sierra Soccer was somewhere in between my beloved football managers and arcade games, and that was, it seems, a sweet spot for me. In the end, all you need to know, that it's a very fun game. Not as widely spread or well known as the other footballing behemoths on the Amiga, but just as fun. I have a love-hate relationship with SimCity 2000 on the Amiga. I love it on PC, but absolutely despise it on the Amiga. While I couldn't play it back then as I only had Amiga 500, a friend had a 1200 and it was just a pain to watch. To watch, because it wasn't playable at all. It wasn't an upgraded system at all, so perhaps that's the case here, but by 1994, when Commodore was already on its way out, it was difficult to justify a costly upgrade to most likely soon to be dead machine. And judging by the comments on Lemon Amiga game page, even people with accelerators and extra memory had very different experiences with SimCity 2000, ranging from slow but playable to absolute disasters. Well, one way or another, whether it was a crappy port or game that was just not meant to be on the Amiga, it did come out on it and was a city building and management simulation, a successor to ever popular first title, where you're in charge of building and expanding a city while keeping its finances afloat and residents happy. 
a gem on PC and a game I spent hundreds of hours playing and would hope that experiences of Amiga players were similar. Though it's hard to imagine. The difference between Super Stardust and Stardust we've spoke about in the last video covering 1993 may be subtle, but they're important and game-changing. First, it's an AGA exclusive, so only working on machines with the chipset, but that allows for 256 colors graphic, making this already beautiful title even more enchanting. Second, and also last it seems, while still posing a formidable challenge, Super Stardust is much much easier than the first game with most deaths not being cheap and inevitable, but usually a direct result of player's mistake. Which may not seem like a lot, but makes a huge difference with a game feeling challenging as opposed to frustrating a year earlier. Some issues prevailed, however, like inability to fly backwards or to remap controls of a shield to a second button, but I suppose it's something to get used to, even if it's a bit annoying. Anyway, for those who haven't seen the last video, Super Stardust is a single-screen arcade shooter that could be described as asteroids on steroids, it's bigger, better, offers many more kinds of debris and enemies to shoot, upgrades to ship's weaponry and mind-bending faux 3D super smoothly animated tunnel shooter sections between regular levels. Even if a bit simple at its premise, it's a real fun title if you like challenging games and one worth having in a collection, even if just a show-off of Amiga's capabilities. Team Park is easily one of my most favorite games on the Amiga. It's a management simulation where you run your, well, amusement park. While Team Park offers sort of campaign where you can conquer different parts of the world building parks there, the game itself is quite open-ended and you don't really have to ever leave the area that you choose or particularly like and can just stay there amassing wealth. And you're responsible for everything to keep the place running and the money flowing. From building of various attractions, hiring staff, research, supplemental facilities, prices, to even such minute details like queue placement for each ride and amount of sugar in ice cream or bubbles in sodas. In spite of cute and colorful graphics, the financial simulation backbone of Team Park is not thin and it's pretty complex. There are a lot of things that need to be balanced, like the time each ride can be used to be as profitable as possible, opposed to when it should be maintained to remain safe and attractive. Or distance and location of soda and fast food vendors from certain attractions and toilets, to maximize the profit and keep the guests in the park for as long as possible. After all, the longer they'll stay, the more money they'll spend. Team Park is an amazing game, first in Bullfrog's Team series of games and a title that's full of quirky humor and unpredictable situations. I'd argue that it can be enjoyed by most, even those who don't particularly care for strategies or management games. UFO Enemy Unknown is a hard title for me to talk about. It's one of my most favorite games of all time, and a start to the series that I play to this day, albeit in newer, modern outings of XCOM and XCOM 2 by Firaxis. It's a mixture of grand strategy with tactical combat encounters and base management. Explosive mixture that delivers a lot of fun, given its run on appropriately fast system. Still, I completed original UFO on my faithful Amiga 500 at least twice, and had a blast. But I also learned a lot about patience while doing so and wouldn't recommend approaching the game with this configuration to anyone. A1200 is probably the barest minimum the game should be played on, and even that in some latter missions may become unpleasant to experience. I suppose O30 CPU with some extra RAM is enough to run the UFO comfortably on the Amiga, but in 1994 compared to general Amiga's gamers populace, those who had at least that configuration were few and far between. Today UFO is probably best played on PC using either Steam or GOG versions, as they run excellently and can be enjoyed on even the potatoest of machines. Yep, I'm aware there's no such word. Or there was no such word, cause now there is. Anyway, the game as mentioned initially is a mixture of genres. So you have your strategic layer where you're seeing a globe in its full glory and can build bases, detect alien ships and in turn command your ships to either shoot them down or take your troops to mission sites. Then there is a management bit where you're in full control of your base's design and expansion, adding rooms as needed, each with its unique properties, hiring soldiers, scientists and engineers. This is also where you run research, manufacture and arm both your units and ships. Arguably outside of the missions, this is where you'll spend most of your time. And finally, a tactical layer where you take your team and tackle the alien forces on the ground. It's what you'll easily be doing the most of. Controlling all your units individually in turn-based very atmospheric and difficult combat. And even though it's played in turns, whomever played the UFO can confirm that it still could be called action-packed. Cause while it's not real-time, it's definitely blood pressure raising experience. Just not on basic Amigas. Universe is a sci-fi point-and-click adventure game developed by Core Design. It was originally supposed to be a sequel to the earlier title Curse of Enchantia, but ended up being a standalone title. 
It tells a story of a young man who has been transported from our world to another universe on the pretense that he's to be that universe's savior. The game has been critically acclaimed and is often cited as being one of the very best adventure games on the Amiga, both story-wise and because of the technical mastery core design had over the system's chipset. And it's not just empty words either. Universe is displaying 256 simultaneous colors on screen at once, instead of standard 32 on basic OCS Amigas. And it's something that according to Commodore's engineers shouldn't have been possible with moving images and scaling sprites. But it is, thanks to Core Design's own innovative tech called SPAC, which stands for Super Pre-Adjusted Color and works in a mysterious and magical way that I have no way of ever understanding. It looks good though, and that's what counts in my books. If that wasn't enough, they've also created a dynamic music system for the game very similar to LucasArts' iMuse. And the main character Sculling Sprite was digitized rotoscope version of one of the game designers, Rolf Moore. It's hard not to ponder now what would have been possible on the Amiga if it would receive AGA chipset 3-4 years earlier and long-awaited AAA chip around this time, as it was said to be as capable as that in the heart of the first PlayStation. Core Design could create art with that power. But it never happened and we can only imagine what if. On a side note as I wrote this, cause yeah, grand majority of talking points I tackle has been at least in part pre-written, I've checked Core Design's game library on the Amiga and it's like no other. There isn't a single bad title there. All are brilliant at best or good at worst. It's just amazing. Wow, that was a year, right? I mean, sure, it's clear that there wasn't as many great games as a year or two earlier, but those that were good were really good and more and more of them were taking full advantage of AGA chipset. Which was, well, an odd choice given Commodore's state in 1994, but I suppose the developers didn't have to know Commodore's internal workings. One way or another, beginning of the year Amiga gamers who followed the news had a lot to wait for, unbeknownst to the inevitable fate that was dawning over Commodore. And even though soon after they've learned the grim truth, which was reflected in the amount of games that came out a year later, we're not gonna tackle it here today as it's a subject for another video which coincidentally will be the last in the series and will close the history of 10 most important years of Amiga's gaming. That said, after exchanging ideas with few of my subscribers, I've decided to release one additional episode covering all years 1996 and after, as a sort of a supplemental bonus video, one to close the Amiga gaming history chapter for good. It doesn't mean I'm done with the Amiga, not in the slightest, but that it will be the end of this particular series. I can promise that the video will be released a week after the official last, as I'd like to release a couple of other ones in between, cause I've been thinking about them for a little while now. But it will not come much later. On a side note, I was thinking about another of those series, but for a different platform. Maybe C64, or golden years of DOS gaming? 10 years of PC DOS gaming history has a nice ring to it. Or Sega Genesis, perhaps. I'm still not that set on particular system. It's not going to be Nintendo though, at least until I make sure that they're not aggressively DMCAing channels for content on their games and platforms anymore. Uh, whatever. I seem to be going all over the place with this now. So, not to prolong this video anymore, if you liked it, please hit those like and subscribe buttons below. They are literally two clicks away for you, but can be a game changer for me. And if you're in a more generous mood, you may consider joining my Patreon. It will help me release better content, upgrade my editing rig, maybe even get a camera to put the face to the voice. Or maybe even do some live streams, who knows. Anything is possible. For now though, this is all, so have a good one and I'll see you next week. Peace.